Um, greetings all, my name is Professor Les Henry and welcome to The Outer View, where reason comes first. And today I'm delighted to say I welcome my guest, my very good friend, comrade, Professor Les Black. How are you doing? Yeah, greeting. I'm good, I'm good. Two Leses called Professor, that doesn't happen. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really happen in the real world, but then again... It in the real world. But, um, so can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, like... Uh, a little snapshot about who who is Les Bat? Well, that's a good question. I, I I'm not sure to be honest with you, but I can tell you about things I've done. Yeah. I, uh, I I grew up in South London. You know, I went to school in Croydon in the 1970s and 80s, and uh, studied at Goldsmiths College the year of the New Cross fire, which really politicised me and and made me think about all kinds of things. I'm sure we'll come back to that in our talk today about whiteness and race and racism and class. And I've spent, you know, 30 years, I guess, pursuing those themes and passions and commitments um, through education and through activism and through being involved, I suppose, in the politics um, of race and racism, uh, both as an educator, but more broadly in sort of the spheres of popular culture and sport and music, things like that. Yeah, there's, there's a few things I want to discuss you know, with you. And as I said, we're, we're, we're going to just reason on this show. So it's a conversation because um, I'm just not into all that debating, you know, who is cleverer than whose stuff. I think it's, it's non-productive and I think the time is too crucial for us to walk down that road. Well, Les, you know, one of the things that we, I guess, well, that we've always done is think. And, you know, name calling isn't thinking and it feels like we, we are stuck in a time of name calling and of certainty that limits thinking and reasoning and, and it's why I think what you're trying to do with this is is great actually and really an, a different thing a different way to foster yeah. thought and I give thanks because that whole beer bait in culture is one of the reasons why I've kind of stepped away from some of this media stuff because it really isn't productive and and to me what happens is you get distracted so here's the issue over here then all of a sudden you're talking about something that really doesn't relate and it doesn't help and the time is far too serious for that. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think, you know, power makes people comfortable. Yeah. And if you're serious about addressing questions of power, violence, um, then it means having to confront the discomforts of power and one's own implication in that. And, you know, I think that's something I've always thought. You know, people often say to me, Les, you know, well, why do you do the things that you do? Why did you make those choices? Well, I don't think I made any choices. I just think that that was the world that I was formed by and that a world that we kind of were formed by together in different ways and sometimes in direct ways. And, you know, so, of course, you know, white people like me growing up in you know, kind of complicated worlds where there's measures of connection and friendship across the colour line, as well as racism being circulated in your family, in the world beyond, you know, in your relation to the police, say, you know, yeah. the police thinking, yeah. oh, he's a white kid, he, he's less dangerous than his black friend, mm -hmm. so let's co focus on his black friend. Um, so it's, of course, you know, as a, as a white person in that world, you don't experience racism directly, but you certainly experience the reproduction of racism, the expectations that racism yeah. um, cultivates, and also the way of seeing and educating the senses to uh, see and understand the world. Of course you experience that. That's as close as life itself. Yeah. So the idea that, you know, you choose, I, that's something that I chose to do, misses how, you know, deeply implicated... Um, we all are in in the struggle around uh, racial justice. Yeah, and I would actually pick up on a few things that I know I've definitely, you know, I don't know if the word is, you've influenced my thinking, you've definitely impacted my thinking profoundly. And most people who, who've had conversations with me, are, there are names I always call up, and yours is one of them. Because I know that, you know, people may not know, but, you came under a lot of pressure from the far right groups when they were proper far right extremist groups in the UK. And I remember having that quality of conversation with you about that and those experiences, because as you say, just because you're white, because of the way you've positioned yourself within this anti-racist 
struggle and not just in the context of name but anybody who's reasoned with you for five seconds will know exactly where where your alliances are because it's about the human family and this for me is what is qualitatively different from say some of the other people who we see you know supposedly as anti-racist because in your own journey you had that to, to contend with which is you know the attacks you were getting from the far right you know extremists and people can read about this in in your work but for me it was also the fact that and it's not about just putting your neck out it's about saying this is wrong and this is what i can do so one of the examples i'm thinking about is when we were doing a project at Lewisham Way Centre with, with um, this youth group, Ubuntu, which is run by a good friend of mine, Danny Pink, who will be featured in an interview. Yeah. And I remember how, you know, those children, those black youth were really struck by your, your, your overstanding of what they were actually going through. You know, that's uh, the first commitment, um, I always think. But advice, you know, I, I, it's partly why, you know, when you asked me to produce my three points, discomfort was one of the things that I, comes to mind, you know, embrace discomfort. If yeah. you're not uncomfortable about this stuff, then you're not doing it right. You know, if you're too comfortable in those pronouncements, then that means you're really not being honest with yourself. Wow. So I, I, I think that's one thing I would say, but, but also it's a really important balance to try and think about between on the one hand, you know, speaking about these questions and ones and, and my implication in them, not outside of them, not yeah. at a distance, yeah. from the centre of my own experience of life. So on the one hand, being able to do that, but at the same time, realising that actually my experience is not the most important one in this conversation and allowing and having the humility to step back and allow other experiences to be heard, be recognised, to, to be to be given the value and the importance that yeah. they, they that they that they um, should be given uh, and and seriously so I think that thing about the balance between on the one hand having the courage to speak and also to put your neck on the line if it Matt, if it comes to it at the same time of realizing of, of humility and stepping back and I learned that very early you know not in in an abstract way not in the library in face-to-face -face encounters with people and realizing what you know and, and if being open to that yeah. and listening to what people were saying and and recognizing it and seeing it for what it is uh, i think those are the 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 things i would say so on the one hand yes speaking and speaking out there's been a lot about you know the complicity of silence lately yeah. and i think that's absolutely right sometimes it's very easy to kind of, I think whiteness is a way of seeing, hearing, sensing, and acting. So you step back into that, the shadow of whiteness, and you hide in that silence. That's damage, real damage. Yeah. At the same time, I think silence is an important thing as a place of contemplation. You know, I can think sometimes when people have invited me to give talks, I'm thinking, actually, do you, do you want me to go and do that big public lecture and be the white professor, I think you should get someone else to do it. Yeah. Step away, not make a big scene about it, but just step away, not take that opportunity to speaking to provide space for someone else. Yeah, I think it's very important, you know, when you're speaking about silence, because, you know, one of your great books is The Art of Listening. And I remember you are the person who really, and this was when I was a, your PhD student, and I remember you said to me this thing, and it's always resonated with me, and I still use it with my PhD students or my whatever students now. And it's that thing about having your antenna up all the time. Sometimes you've got to pull them back. You've got to take a step back and just listen. You know, you've got to listen. And that's why, you know, again, your book about the art of listening is about, you know, that kind of, that experiential exchange where sometimes you don't need words. You listen, but not just with your ears. You listen, you take in everything, you know, you observe what is going on. And I think, you know, you can't listen when you're talking. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And silence is not empty in that way. It shouldn't be, it, you know, a kind of productive, um, critical silence. 
is a space of contemplation of taking things in of checking yourself actually and thinking yeah. hold on a minute what yeah. where am i in this i can't i can't be i can't be doing that process of critical thought if i'm sort of pontificating to the world and telling the world how it is yeah. you know yeah. um and so i think that that doubtful silence that is productive is important as a kind of uh, as a resource in undermining whiteness and, and in developing a different sense of, of who you are and, and who you want to be in the world and how you want to see the world and how you want to act. Yeah, and that is actually crucial. It is about how you want to see the world and how you want to act. But when you were speaking, it reminded me of my dad, peace be upon him. You know, when, when before we got some licks, you know, like if he spoke to us and he knew we weren't listening, it was, you know, you know why God give you one more than two ears? Sometimes you must listen twice as hard before you open it. So, yeah. I'm not, you never yeah maybe, you remind, maybe you remind me of my dad, Les. I don't know. Oh, come on. That's yeah. great. I'm, I'm borrowing that from you. Yeah. So, um, so, Les, I know one of the things that I've picked up on you is you, it's, it's, it's almost like you say that there should be almost like an active shaming, but not shame in the sense that you want to cause people embarrassment, but there's a kind of qualitative dimension that, you know, perhaps you could develop that for us. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of, you know, the activities uh, online and uh, that have been raising the kind of questions of police racism uh, and, and also of whiteness more broadly, you know, and of a broad kind of... Uh, reflection on, on on the politics of racism really in its history uh, one of the things that i think is circulating through social media and other kinds of sort of versions of screen life um can 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 create all kind of ambivalent feelings um for white viewers and you know one of the things i think is a tr that is important to hold on to a bit like um, the importance of discomfort is the importance of shame some things are shameful in in the history of 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 you know dehumanization that racism is really all about yeah. there's no way of reckoning with that history without shame it is deeply shameful violating violent um and there's no there's no there can be no gilding that experience you know mm -hmm. so i think shame and reckoning with that is really important um and, you know, sometimes I think it's important to make people feel uncomfortable about that legacy if yeah. they're trying to gloss it, you know, or make it something else. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the work that we do, actually, in in taking that history seriously and also its contemporary um, manifestations is important in both the service of both shame and hope. Hope yeah. in the sense of, you know, you have to face the world and its history, its past, and its past. So I think, you know, it's really important to connect that sense of shame and shaming the world with a kind of hopeful sense of things. You can't really imagine a different kind of world if you don't face its past and its presence now. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, shame is, is a productive thing uh, and, and that should yeah. be embraced. And you know something, Les, it's really interesting that you say that because... I've had these conversations with you before. So, for instance, when I go into schools during so-called Black History Month, and the schools will be, let's say, predominantly Black children, as soon as they see me, there's that overwhelming sense of shame because they think, oh, here he is. It's going to be about slavery and blah, blah, blah. And there is that shame. And it's really interesting that you say that the shame can be used in a productive way because that is exactly what I do. Because I say to them, yes, you can feel a sense of shame, but what was done to us by racist Europeans is what was shameful. We shouldn't be ashamed of the way we've been depicted historically, because that is part of that process. But the shame in that sense can be productive because it opens up an, an avenue or an area for you to discuss. So I think that is a really interesting point because you can you can kind of juxtapose it from a, a, a black position to a white position. And yeah. somewhere in the middle, you can deal with those those notions of shame. And I think it is crucial, you know, that you, you raise that point. Because it is 
it, it, essential to how we discuss these things because if you feel ashamed of your past as an African person or a person of African ancestry like myself, I get that because usually it's born out of ignorance or the way you've been programmed within the wider public arena. But what perhaps I didn't consider until, you know, I've had these conversations with you was how it can be used productively, especially from a white perspective. Because mm, no until, you, until you encounter that history face on, you'll never divest of it. Or you just simply reproduce it. Yeah. You know, you simply just replay over and over and over again the same damage you know and i think because you, you know it makes total sense to me les you know because in in a different way in the teaching environment or work or talking with young people you know who wants to be thought of as a problem you know du bois wrote about this you yeah. know a century ago and yeah. and of course you know that's gonna that's gonna impose shame actually to be thought to be a problem and a victim yeah. um you know one of the, our great teachers who we share, Paul Gilroy, had this fantastic formulation, you know, the way in which, you know, particularly young black people were thought of as either and both victims and problems. Yes. And both of those things was a straitjacket, you know, it's both of them. Yeah. Were. Yeah. But I, I guess what I'm trying to think about, and I've been trying to live by it really, is, well, you know, you can, you can be ashamed of something and against it. Yes. Um, and you can be for something else or the potential of a movement to something else absolutely so that's the thing that i think is powerful about shame you know i mean i think i've told you this before but you know as a teenager i walked past um 439 new cross road every day and saw that you know burnt out shell of a house and and how those young black people who died there who were my age you know they weren't cared about they were lives that didn't matter. Yeah. They were not even acknowledged. I mean, put to one side the details of what happened that night, but those lives just didn't matter. And that was an undeniable truth. Yeah. You know, 13 dead, nothing said. That's that, you know, and so and that's deeply shameful. You know, it's yeah. deeply shameful. I mean, you, you came to the exhibition of Von Ware's photographs that we had at Goldsmiths, and I you know, that was a difficult thing to do. And I made mistakes in doing that. And you know, that's another thing I think is important in terms of the lessons that you asked me about at the beginning. We make mistakes. What do you do when you make a mistake? You try and make it right. That's what I think. Yeah. Um, and there were mistakes that I made about the details of some of the experiences of the, of the young people who died there or their names and stuff like that, which I tried to, which the families brought up that I was open to and I tried to change. Yeah. Anyway, so one of them... One of the families, who I won't mention because I don't want to betray the comp confidence, after having some very difficult conversations about how to change the exhibition, sat me down. Um, and we were having a cup of tea in the morning. Uh, things had been changed. Everything was, everything was as it should have been in the beginning in terms of the exhibition. Um, and uh, the, the relative of, uh, it was, the, yeah, it was, a, it was a sibling of somebody who died. Yeah, uh, this is the new cross fire we're talking about. It's the new cross fire we're talking about, yeah, which happened in 1981. Um, and you know, 13 young black people died, and then the 14th died uh, two years later. Anyway, so the relative of, of, of the person who'd been lost said, Why are you doing this? I just want to know why you're doing this. Um, and I, I said at the time, you know. And it wasn't an, it wasn't an hostile inquiring or you know why you you know so it was just she wanted to know she wanted to know why I was doing it what why it mattered to me, um, and I said to her you know your brother uh, is exactly the same age as me. You know, his future was stolen from him, um, and that's a life that I've been able to live. Um, and there's something about that that's deeply has always been deeply haunting to me. Mm. And so, you know, in a way, you know, the reason why I wanted to do those things, because I'm completely, you know, aware in my own mind, in my conscious mind, that, you know, there was a whole group of young people, you know, whose futures were stolen. And that those futures were something that I have, um, you know, enjoyed the possibility of. Yeah. And so, you know, we make choices. And what we do with our life and 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 i felt was the important 
to acknowledge that and at the same time try and do something that would yeah. speak back to or to or to create something a possibility where that history could be acknowledged and and reckoned with well i suppose the thing i'd like people to take away from the out of you today i love the idea of the out of you what i'd like people to take out of this conversation is that you know whiteness and racism is about confining even white people too it's a straight jacket it's an expectation i mean i think about it in my youth you know jokes you were expected to laugh at you know ways of thinking about the world you were expected to agree with and so you know rubbing that against the grain pushing back against it pushing it back against the authority of of whiteness and sometimes it was the authority of the people that you love the most too yeah. and that's not an easy thing to do um but I, I think in a way that sense of confinement it's not just about doing the right thing although it is the right thing to do uh but i think it's also about a broader sense of, a, of the kind of person that you might want to be and not to be the person that other people have decided that you are actually yeah so in a way I, i've always thought the the struggle against racism and the skepticism about whiteness is about a broader sense of what humanity can be and one's place within that human family yeah you know i, I think it's uh, humanity isn't a starting point god we've had an inhuman history haven't we and we're just wrecking with it now it's an inhuman history absolutely humanity isn't an isn't a starting point that we all share humanity is a arrival point we've yeah. not quite arrived yet yeah at a human family for me that's that's a beautiful way to end this um unless you want to share your you want to share any little secret thing with us in the world of uh, youtube and uh zoom lectures you can't really keep any secrets um but you know this but lots of people don't i've i've also had a life that's run parallel to my academic and political life as a musician as a working musician um and i'm always fascinated by people who've got you know how they use music to draw um they draw music into the way they do their their work as sociologists or social scientists i know you know that you're we first met when you were on the on the mic you know yeah way back in the day. fire film <laughs> some of it yeah yeah exactly so and, and I, I suppose that's the thing that people might might um might might not know about me um it was funny uh, and poignant uh, i was in a brilliant um blues singers band for 10 years called old green old green was born in jamaica you know, Lenny Henry made a TV show a few years ago saying, well, why haven't there ever been any black blues singers? Well, he wasn't paying enough attention because Earl had had 30 years as an unsung yeah. hero of British music, actually. Yeah. And it was his funeral yesterday. And um, uh, he passed uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, in, in the age of COVID-19, there can be no f singing at funerals. Mm. So his a widow asked me to play some guitar at his graveside and uh wow i played i played uh, um his favorite um him um it was his amazing grace so mm -hmm. i played amazing grace and well, that was great because you know the, the roots of it but we'll we'll that's another conversation yeah. for another time. it's another conversation it was oh, i played amazing amazing grace it is complicated yeah. But it's what he wanted, what he would have wanted. I used to play it for, for him when he was very sick and he loved that hymn. That's it was his beautiful. favorite hymn. That's anyway, so I'm standing there. There's the Catholic priest. He looks like Moses, white hair, white guy, white robes. I'm standing next to him. Hollywood with, uh, Moses will have, yeah. He was the Hollywood Moses, yeah. Like, I was thinking about Muhammad Ali, actually, when he said, why is everything white? You know, he was, yeah. he was it. So I'm standing next to him with a guitar dressed completely in black. Um, with black sunglasses, you know, because uh, that's what I would wear on stage with Earl. Um, so okay. it was one last gig with him. But the thing that was beautiful, Les, that, that it, um, because there's no singing allowed at funerals in our time of the pandemic, um, there could be no songs. Um, so I was playing um, music for them, playing tunes for them. And then at one point I decided just to play at the end, just to kind of lighten the mood. Uh, just a blue shuffle. Yeah. So it was like, you know, with the, with the emphasis on the two and four of the beat. And there was 
25 people there, all of his relatives, you know, Jamaican family, mm -hmm. London family. Um, and they started to clap on the two and the four. And it was a beautiful thing, actually. That's your antiphonic exchange. There. Exactly. So they were clapping. They couldn't sing. They were clapping. And then, you know, it was a big finish. The, the tune ended. And then everyone applauded. And it was like one last encore for Earl, who, you know, spent his life as a working musician. And it was, oh. um, it yeah. was an amazing moment, actually. Yeah. There's also so, a half decent. Yeah, I know. Do you want me to tell that story? <laughs> Just, I think we, we're more or less out of time. But um, time, yeah. I know you were a half decent basketballer. Oh, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my life, mate. That was everything yeah. to me. So, Professor Les Black, it's been an honour and a privilege, and all I can say is, you know, stay blessed, stay focused, and I know we'll link up soon. Yeah, thanks, Les. It's always a blessing and a pleasure. So, thank you for this t opportunity, really. The out of you. We give thanks.